All right, Ecclesiastes chapter 7. If you found that, why don't you stand? We'll read together God's Word. Ecclesiastes 7, we'll start in verse 13 and read down to verse 18. If you're a guest with us, you're watching online for the first time, we sing together, pray together, then we open God's Word. We stand out of reverence for God's Word. We believe this is how God speaks. We'll read it, I'll pray, and then we'll just talk about what does the Bible say. Grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our God stands forever. Let's begin in verse 13. <clears throat> Consider the work of God. Who can make straight what he has made crooked? In the day of prosperity, be joyful. And in the day of adversity, consider. God has made the one as well as the other so that man may not find out anything that will be after him. In my vain life, I have seen everything. There is a righteous man who perishes in his righteousness and there is a wicked man who prolongs his life in his evil doing. Be not overly righteous and do not make yourself too wise. Why should you destroy yourself? Be not overly wicked, neither be a fool. Why should you die before your time? It is good that you should take hold of this, and from that withhold not your hand. For the one who fears God shall come out from both of them. Join me as we pray. <clears throat> Father, I pray in the name of Jesus, on the authority of your word, by the power of your spirit, we ask you to speak to us. I pray that you administer to our souls and into our hearts and who we are. Take away worry and anxiety and depression and fear. Replace it with a deep joy in the goodness of our good God. And so speak to your people today. In Jesus' name we ask, amen. You may be seated. Not too long ago, a friend of mine wrote a devotional book. If you're looking for a good devotion, uh, he is a professor at Midwestern Baptist Theological Seminary, and he wrote a book called Always in the Hands of God. Always in the Hands of God. It's a, it's a really good compilation. What it is is a daily reading of Jonathan Edwards' writing. You might remember Jonathan Edwards, a great preacher from the 18th century. He was president at Princeton College back then. He was a missionary to the American Indians. He was a brilliant man. But Jonathan Edwards is a man that suffered greatly in the world and was used greatly by the Lord. Which I think is important for those of us that are Bible-believing Christians in the 21st century because there is an increasing probability that we will suffer greatly in this world. But even still, even if we do suffer greatly in this world, we want to be used greatly by the Lord. We, we want to trust that our lives are always in God's hand. Do you believe that about your life? I, I want you to believe that. As a Christian, I, I want you to walk with confidence. I, I want you to live with joy. I want you to get up in the morning with, with hope in the God that loves you in Christ. Because the truth is that we live in a fallen world, and in this fallen world, it is easy to hear all the noise and all that noise starts stripping away whatever joy you might have. I mean, honestly, right now, it can really feel like we have woken up in some alternative universe. I mean, as Bible-believing Christians, we believe that Genesis 1 and 2 gives us the creation account that God in His goodness created man and woman in the image of God, both male and 
female, that both genders created by God or created in his image, created to reflect glory back on God, that the two genders are beautiful to God. They're right. That's what he's created. We believe that because the Bible teaches that. And then we see something that seems as, as odd as the Equality Act coming through, pass, passing in the House, is going to go to the Senate. And, and I won't go into detail there, but just to say that there's so much surrounding us that Christians today in 2021 and following, you and I that are Bible-believing Christians, we need to be equipped. We need to be strengthened in our faith. We need to be resolute in doctrine. And like never before, we need to trust that we are always in God's hand. I think the preacher, that's Solomon, I think the preacher in chapter 7 helps us with that. If you pick up chapter 7 and you start reading it, you start in verse 1, you read down, and the first 12 verses, what you find there are 12 uh, proverbs, there are 12 sayings, 12 aphorisms. They're sort of loosely connected together. And then you get to verse 13, and there in verse 13, he seems to turn our attention to worldview, how you look at the world. And more importantly, he turns our attention to how you look at the world and live in the world and how you actually make your way at this time in history. It's no accident when you were no accident that you were born when you were born, where you were born, where you ended up, and the time you were living, God has put you there to bring honor to Him at this time in history. And so today I, I hope this passage will uh, I hope it'll wash over your soul. I, I hope that you will have your spirit refreshed from God's Word so that you might genuinely rejoice in our good and sovereign God because your life is safe in the hands of God. I, I, want, this, I want this sermon to be a help to you so that you can start your week. It's going to start Monday. I want you to start your week with a joyful confidence in our good and sovereign God. Now, when I started studying, I came up with several things. I had, I had about five things I wanted you to see here. Um, I, I brought it down to four. I, I try to be aware of how long you can stand to hear me talk. I preached at Southern Seminary, Southern Seminary's chapel this, this week. Uh, they asked me to preach at their chapel service, except they're not having chapel in chapel. It's all virtual. So I came and stood right here, and Christina brought a camera closer and preached, and I preached that camera for chapel, and uh, they told me, you've got 20 minutes to do the sermon, to pack in a full sermon into 20 minutes. So I was talking like I had had 12 cups of coffee or something. There's no telling what I said for that chapel service. So I'm going to take you through and give you just four things I think that we need to do more of. Let, let's, let's you and I start with something good. Here's the first one, number one. You need to enjoy life more. You need to recognize the good things that God has given you, big things, small things, all kinds of things, hundreds, probably thousands of things up to this point in this day alone, and we need to enjoy them more. Let me show you where I get that. You'll find it right there in verse 14, and the very first phrase of verse 14, see what the preacher says? In the day of prosperity, be joyful. Now, lest you think I've dropped off into a prosperity gospel that I'm going to preach like Joel Osteen or something, don't, don't worry. I know some of you, you immediately hear the word prosperity. That's where you go. Well, let's go back and look at the passage and, and let's translate it. This is a literal translation. In the day of good, that word prosperity is tov, good. In the day of good, the preacher says, be in the good. In other words... When something good happens to you, something that is joyful, something that is going to make you smile, you need to enjoy that. There, there are big times, small times, large things that God does for us, small things that God does for us, 
that God gives these wonderful gifts for us to enjoy. And if you don't watch out, what happens is your, your life goes at such a pace, you forget to actually enjoy the gifts that God's given. And if you run past those gifts, if you squander those, if you waste those gifts, then they are just gone. I mean, honestly, we live in a time when this, the common grace of God has given us technology enough that we can actually capture moments. It's why we take pictures. Uh, it's why you have pictures of your children when they were small and uh, had good manners and did what you told them to do. It's why those pictures bring joy to your heart. It's why we take pictures. Of, it's why you, take these, you capture these wonderful moments. Why? Because they're good. And... and and it's good and right for us to acknowledge that God has given us these wonderful moments of laughter, of smiling, of happiness. Some of you have had these moments of success, of, of feeling love or extending love or fellowship with a good friend or the smile of a grandchild or the, the if you like coffee, the taste of a piping hot good cup of coffee. For me, for me it'd be the the sound of a well-tuned American V8. It's a gift. And the preacher says, you've only got so long to live. God has given us wonderful gifts by way of common grace. He sends the rain and the sunshine on the just and the unjust. He's given that to us to enjoy. And all of those things are reminders of the goodness of God. Every gift that you have, every good thing, every nice thing that you've experienced, every single one of them is a voice that's part of a choir that sings one song that says, Our God is good. And His goodness finds its ultimate display at the cross of Jesus where sinners can be saved. Now, I... I know that things are bad all over. It feels sometimes like we swim in a sea of badness. But you need to, you need to look and see some of the good things that God has given you and enjoy those things. You need to enjoy a little more this life that God has given you. What is it? What are the gifts that you haven't recognized lately that you need to enjoy this life a little more? Why? Because your life is safe in the hands of God. So if we're going to enjoy life a little more, let me give you a second thing to consider. It's going to be in the same verse. Number two, you'll find it right there in verse 14. Number two, you need to be still a little more. You need to be still. Let me show you where I get that. Let's take verse 14, read the whole verse, take it all in its context, and hear what the preacher is saying right there in verse 14. See what he says? Look at it. He says, in the day of good, in the day of prosperity, in the day of good, be in the good. And in the day of adversity, that word adversity, it's, it's the word evil, it's the word bad. In the day of adversity, in the day of evil, what do you do? Consider. That word consider is just literally the word see. Sit, look, think. What are you thinking? Verse 14, keep looking at it. Consider, God has made the one, the good day, as well as the other, the bad day. And he's done that, right there in verse 14, you're looking at it. He's done that so that man may not find out anything in the future. Honestly, you ought to circle verse 14. You ought to, that verse right there. There are times when I'm studying the Bible, getting ready for a sermon, that certain passages, passages just minister to my own soul that help me, my own walk with the Lord. And verse 14 is one of those verses that you can anchor your life on. Because verse 14, it's a beautiful description of the ongoing life of ups and downs. Of sometimes we're smiling and things are great and God has given us these. And sometimes they're down here low and they're terrible and painful and even feel evil. And yet God has given those as well. And it's God that carries us. He carries us through ups and downs. And through it all, the preacher says, you can trust him. 
In fact, the word, consider, stop and see. Look and see that it is our good God who's in control. Our good God is, is working. Look, I, I want to stay here. And just Let's just push on this verse a little bit more. Let's see what we can squeeze out of this little verse right here in verse 14. Do you know that in the bad times and hurtful times and the hard times, Lord knows some of you have been through some tragedy. In the tragic, look deep in this verse now, in the tragic times, the preacher says, I want you to consider and see that it's God. It says the same thing back in verse 13. Look up, look up in verse 13. The preacher says, consider the work of God. What God? Consider the work of God. Who can make straight what God has made crooked? You can't fix it. Get her in your mind. Get the issue in your mind. Get him in your mind. You can't fix him. What is it? A bad job? What is the issue? A wayward child? A friend that's gone completely off the rails? Maybe you've got a hateful parent? You can't fix it. This text... It's going to be hard for some of you because the Christian impulse is to help. The Christian impulse, we see a problem, we want to be a help. But you need to look deep into this text. This text doesn't say you need to run in there and fix the situation. That's not what this text says. This text says in the good, you need to be in the good. When things are great, you need to enjoy that. Thank God for it. Down here in the bottom where it's terrible and you can't understand it, what do you do? See. The word consider, see. Stand there and watch. You're an observer. You are not responsible. God is responsible. You are not responsible for saving a person or fixing a situation. And if you don't watch out, if you don't watch out, you're going to drive yourself crazy trying to fix a problem or a person. You can't do it. Look to God. You see, God does these good things. Verse 14, God does these good things one day just like the other. God does these good things, but keep looking at it. He brings us into these hard things, these painful things, these hurtful things things. Why does he do that? Look at verse 14. It's right there in the text. Verse 14, why does he do it? Look at the very end of it. So that you might not find out what's in the future. What does that mean? So that you might be reminded that you are not God. God is God. And this God is good. He reigns over everything. He does these things in our lives to remind us that we are not the masters of our destiny. Do not walk around saying that you are not the master of your own destiny. It is God who governs his creation. It is God who arranges the times and the seasons. He raises up kings. He brings down kings. He controls the future. It, it's why as Christians that we love, it's why we love Romans 8.28 so much. That God, working all things together for the good of those that love him, are called according to his purposes. Romans 8, 28. If I was going to get a tattoo from a Bible verse, that'd be the one I'd get. Just spell it right if you decide to do that. Romans 8, 28. That God is working all things together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And this text is telling us not only to enjoy life more, but we need to actually be still more Consider. But being still doesn't mean doing nothing. What do you do when you're still before the Lord? You are a couple of things. One, you ought to be actively trusting God. Actively trusting God. Some of you are having a hard time trusting God. It would be good for you just to say to the Lord, Lord, I'm, 
I'm having a hard time trust, but I want to trust you. Help me to trust more. I put my trust in you. Actively trusting God. We need to be genuinely praying. That is to say, taking these situations or the people, whoever they are, and pleading with God to do something. I mean, that's why we pray, because we believe in a sovereign God who is able to do. So we, we go to Him in prayer. The Bible commands us to pray. We, we do so genuinely. How do you... How do you consider, how are you being still? You ought to be sincerely worshiping. God is always, with his people, set aside one day of worship. He did it from, very, from the very beginning in the creation. He set aside one day of rest as a symbol that this group of people will be different. And then with the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus, that Sabbath is kept, and the Lord's Day is given to us, a day of, of celebration. That's why we go to church on Sunday, a day of celebration. We, we praise God for the resurrection that secures us, and, and worship ought to be genuine. The songs we sing, the prayers we utter, the, you ought to be engaged in that. How do you stand still and consider? For some of you, it's going to be patiently, this is a hard one, patiently, suffering to the glory of Jesus, going through something that is tragic or terrible or hurtful even to you, and you walking through it in such a way that your life becomes a witness to the goodness of God. Your life adorns the gospel. And hopefully we are, I hope this from my own heart, that we are slowly growing in confidence that our good God is in control. Why? Because your life is safe in the hands of God. Need to enjoy life a little more? Number two, we need to be still a little more. Let me give you a third thing to consider. Number three, that is that you need to reject karma a little more. Reject karma. When I say karma, I mean this idea that if you do something nice, then somebody's going to do something nice for you. Let me show you where I get that. It's right there. In verse 15. Now remember who wrote this. Solomon is an old man. And here in verse 15, uh, look, I'm going to read this to you. Some of you need an old person in your life. You need somebody with some life experience that has been through it that can speak some truth into your life. Look what, uh, look what, Sol look what Solomon says in verse 15. <clears throat> in my vain life, this is the king talking now, in my vain life, I have seen everything. You need somebody with some experience to give you some help. In my vain life, I have seen everything. There is a righteous man who perishes in his righteousness, and there is a wicked man who prolongs his life in his evil doing. You see what the preacher's saying? Look, I've seen it all. And you want life to be fair? Well, let me just tell you up front, life is not fair. And if you live in this world and you think life should be fair, you're going to go insane. Now, why did I say to reject karma? Because truthfully, most people believe in some form of, even in, even in churches, and you hear it come out of people's mouths, you think, oh, uh, well, somebody breaks down on the side of the road. Well, if I stop and help that person that's broken down on the side of the road, that maybe one day when I'm broken down on the side of the road, somebody will come and help me. If I do something nice for somebody, then maybe one day somebody will do something nice for me. Or the reverse is true. If someone does something terrible to you, you might think, well, one day they'll get theirs. Look, that's, that's, nothing, more than, that's nothing more than karma. And the preacher says, that is terrible theology. Some of you have been alive long enough to know that. Sometimes good people die young. Sometimes rotten people get ahead. Sometimes tragedy strikes great families. Sometimes mean people get the promotion. You've been alive long enough to know that that, that little cheap theology doesn't work. And look, we are the worst with these little chirpy cliches. That, that sound good, but are really nothing more than baptized karma. 
for instance. You've heard it. What goes around comes around. Work hard, good things happen. Early bird gets the worm. Good things come to those who wait. But we've all seen that sometimes you can wait all day and night and nothing comes. You've seen that you got there early and somebody else got the worm. You worked hard all your life and all you got was a terrible paycheck and let go from a job you tried to work hard at. What goes around comes around. Well, maybe what goes around comes around, but it came back around on you. You found out that none of those cliches work. If you live long enough, you find out that that sort of balance in the universe is just not true. And if you, we, we do this, we don't think we do, but if you live by this mindset, when something terrible happens to you, then your very first question is going to be, what did I do to deserve this? Now, if you're asking that question, at the very core of that question, at the core of that question is a heart that believes, look, I've been a pretty good person, and I deserve better than this. That's a sign that we, we for, we've forgotten ourselves. We, we've forgotten that we actually deserve so much worse than what we have. Yet God in His grace, this is what He's done for you now, God in His grace has loved us, He's called us, He saves us on the merits of what Jesus has done on the cross his death on the cross, and it's, it's grace. Ours is a religion of grace. Look, we, we try to do good and right things, not with the hopes that someday, if I do something good for someone, that someday maybe somebody will do something good for me. That's not why we do good and right things. We don't do good and right things hoping that someday someone will do good for us. We do good and right things because someone has already done something radically unbelievable for us at the cross, and his name is Jesus. And we, we, do, we live like we do because we want to honor the name of Jesus. We want our lives to point to Jesus. We, we don't pay things forward. Don't walk around saying, I'm doing something nice paying forward. I don't even know what that means. It's terrible theology. We don't pay things forward. Why? Because everything has already been paid for at the finished work of Jesus on the cross. It's grace. That's what, launch, that, that's what keeps us moving. It's grace. And that's going to now, let's go running headlong into that fourth point. I'll give you one last thing to show you. Number four. <clears throat> You need to study grace more. Study grace. You need a deeper understanding of grace. You, you're never going to get to the bottom of grace. You, you need to think through Christianity and what does Christianity mean? What does it mean to be a Christian? We are products of grace. Our religion is one of grace. Let me show it to you. It's right there in verse 16, 17, and 18. Let's take verse 16 and 17 together. And uh, let me just walk through it a little bit. Sometimes 16 and 17 are misunderstood. There are two things that lead to destruction. One's in verse 16, one's in verse 17. I'm going to read those two verses, but notice verse 16 talks about destruction. Verse 17 talks about dying. I want to give you two words when I get done with verse 16 and 17. It's going to make you feel real smart. Two words. Makes me feel smart even saying them from the pulpit. One word is the word legalism. You're going to find that in verse 16. Legalism, verse 16. The other word uh, is in verse 17 is the word antinomianism. Anti, A-N-T-I, nomianism. It's, it's spelled just like it sounds. comes from the Greek word nomos, which means law. Verse 16 is legalism, living by the law. Verse 17 is antinomos, living against the law. And both of them are wrong. 
Let's go to verse 16, legalism. What does verse 16 say? Be not overly righteous. If you're overly righteous and you make yourself too wise, you'll destroy yourself. Be not overly righteous. Do not make yourself too wise. Why should you destroy yourself? What is he talking about here? The preacher here is giving us a little picture. Here is the person that is convinced of his own righteousness. He's fallen into this sort of works-based religion, this works-based salvation that goes like this. If you do right, you go to heaven. If you do wrong, you go to hell. And that is the very opposite of the gospel. That's not what the gospel teaches. The gospel reminds us of what verse 20 says. You want to drop down and look at verse 20? The preacher says in verse 20, there is not one person that is righteous on earth who does, who never sins. They were all unrighteous. It's why we, it's why we need the great exchange. It's why we preach the gospel. The great exchange. Do you know the great exchange? The great exchange is that at the cross, Jesus, who lived perfectly, at the cross, Jesus takes our sin and receives judgment at the cross. He gets what we deserve. But that's not the only thing that happens at the cross. The great exchange is he gives us his righteousness so that we don't live a life of legalism thinking if we can be good enough, God will save us. We live a life of grace, looking of faith, looking to what Jesus has done for us in his life and death on the cross. Legalism. We need to run away from legalism. You're riding down the road, there's one ditch on one side, it is legalism. Don't run your Christian car into the ditch over in legalism. But there's another side of the road, another ditch. It's in verse 17. It's, it's the word antinomianism, anti-law of God. You don't live by the law of God. You reject the law of God. you find it in verse 17. Let me read it to you. The preacher says, Be not overly wicked, neither be a fool. Why should you die before your time? Legalism, verse 16, puts you in that ditch is destruction. Licentiousness or antinomianism runs you in this ditch and it'll kill you young. Antinomianism, anti-law. Here, here's the picture in verse 17. Here is the person... Here's the person that says that since God has forgiven me, since God's grace covers me, I don't actually have to live a careful life. I, I can live and do what I want to do. I can and live, I don't have to care what the law of God says. And this is what, this is what uh, Paul preached against in Romans chapter 6, remember that? When he said, well, shall I keep on sinning so that grace can, can abound more? And he answers it, of course not. This is the person that would be comfortable with saying that Jesus is Savior and not really Lord. And I would say that person is not a Christian. That Jesus can't be Savior if, if indeed he's not Lord. The Bible teaches that Jesus actually is Lord. And here's what the preacher says. You take verse 16 and verse 17, both of these positions fall off on the edge and miss grace altogether. And then he comes back in verse 18. Here comes the reminder. Look at the end of verse 18. There in verse 18, the greatest reminder of God's grace is the fear of God. Isn't that what it says, verse 18? The one who fears God shall come out of both of them. Why do we fear God? Because God is a loving and holy creator, and we are wretched, degenerate sinners with no hope. If you're outside of Christ, that's your story. You don't commit sins. You actually are a sinner. And yet, Christianity teaches that God is not just judging and angry about sin. He's also loving and kind and gracious and gives us Jesus, the very Son of God, God himself, who also is man, lived perfectly in a way that man can't live. So this is Christianity. Jesus lived perfectly. That's important for us being saved. At the cross, Jesus is crucified, 
And there is where the judgment, God's judgment on sin and all sinners that are going to be saved, it goes on Jesus. And His righteousness comes to any of you who will believe so that any sinner that repents of her sin and puts her faith in Jesus is saved. The fear of God leads to the grace of God. And this passage, for any of you that are not Christians, I, I just want to ask you to come to Jesus. If you will, your life will be safe in the hands of God. For all of you here and you're watching at home that, that are Christians, I, I just want this to be a ministry to your heart, to be reminded. I know it's terrible. Some of the stuff you've been through and, and life is hard. Your life is safe in the hands of God. Do you join me as we pray together? With your heads bowed this morning as we go to the Lord in a time of commitment and prayer. For those of you that need prayer, a good way to remind us of that is uh, just to send an email, a prayer request. Our pastors see that and we pray for you. For those of you here or watching online that have not yet given your life to Jesus, we need to hear from you. You don't need to live your life without Christ. We want to talk to you about what it means to see and believe Jesus is Lord. I want your life to be safe in the hands of God. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your spirit. Apply this to our hearts. Find us faithful. Bless your people. Use us for good. Be honored. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.